Thanks, guys. Did I see John Kiriakou sneaking around there somewhere? I'm comfortably seated. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, pay a kind of tribute, I suppose, to uh, Ron Paul and his institute uh, and the, the people that uh, have supported him uh, over the years uh, and uh, what uh, I know from personal experience is a, a very uh, courageous uh, position. Very and principal position in relation to uh, the the war racket. Uh, I think it's much better to describe it like that rather than saying uh, U.S. foreign policy because there are some parts of U.S. foreign policy which are good, but the war racket which uh, dominates, unfortunately, the uh, decisions that are made in U.S. foreign policy uh, is something that is not good, and. I think we can see this basically from first principles that there are types of human interactions um, which are not zero sum, uh, which as a result of the interaction at work, uh, everyone is left better off. Uh, but when you're building bombs uh, and dropping them on people, uh, with some very rare exceptions, uh, everyone is worse off. Uh, the, Resources that have gone into the construction uh, are wasted, and you have destroyed the productive capacities of those uh, who have their systems or industry uh, destroyed. But it does make a profit uh, for some people involved. Uh, one of the difficulties I have in speaking to this audience is that I think you all know that in, in some ways, uh, not a lot has uh, changed from uh, when Smedley Butler described uh, this phenomenon of the war racket in the 1930s. Uh, there's, a, of course, a, an internal dimension to it uh, and an external dimension, which externally can also be a protection racket. But if you understand that seven, nearly, uh, sorry, just over seven uh, trillion dollars uh, has been spent since 2001 uh, on the uh, various wars that the United States has been in, involved in, pulling in some of its allies, but that expenditure is from the US Treasury, uh, together with the interest that will be paid on the loans that were uh, borrowed uh, to conduct that activity. Uh, you can see the, the, the uh, extent of the wealth transfer into these destructive war industries. And if, if you see that the a US election, uh, let's look at the last one, last federal election, it costs about $2 billion uh, to run. And you compare that to uh, $7 trillion, uh, even just compared, let's say, to Saudi arms contracts of some $400 billion, that even if you just take uh, half a percent on the value of the Saudi arms contracts alone, you can fund uh, both sides of US politics in a, a national election campaign. So that's the, uh, the, the size of the industry uh, that people are up against. Uh, I have a, a question that I'd like someone to answer because the, the, the answer is not clear to me, but I think it's very interesting, which is the US defense budget uh, has increased by about $100 billion this year. Uh, from 600 to 700 billion dollars. Uh, and that's very serious. That's a nearly 20% increase in the military and intelligence budget. Uh, now, Trump in his election campaign promised an increase in the budget. Uh, and he threw down one of his uh, ambitious um, uh, opening negotiation um, positions of the increase of $50 billion. And the uh, Congress, including two thirds of, uh, sorry, the House, including two thirds of uh, Democrats, uh, increased that by another $50 billion. Um, 
Now, $50 billion is the size of the entire Russian military budget. So the Trump not only received all of his ambit claim of an increase of $50 billion, uh, but the Congress has now increased that by another $50 billion. So an increase of double the entire uh, Russian military uh, budget just this year. And I really am very curious as to where uh, that's coming from. So you can perhaps look at some political dimensions of a, of a fight for loyalties. Um, but the, the only element really of hard power that uh, Trump has is perhaps the military and his White House has been infested by generals. So perhaps there's a desire by the Congress also to bid for those loyalties. Uh, or does it reflect a, a much more concerning trend? Uh, and I, I rather think that it does which is the um, contraction in the ability of the US empire to rule itself, uh, or rather rule others, uh, which is of course inevitable as US GDP has uh, declined from some 50% of world GDP uh, to some 20% of world uh, GDP today. Obviously the United State, States can't hang on uh, to its 500 to 1300 military bases, depending on how you count them, uh, across the world, um, when its proportion of global GDP uh, has diminished so much. Uh, so are we seeing what is perhaps uh, the beginnings of the death throes uh, of the war racket in its attempt to hold on to that, uh, which it cannot hold on to? Because there is a an equivalent, uh, which was towards the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, and as its ability to hold on to its territories and regions of influence diminished, uh, its military uh, budget started to skyrocket uh, as well. And if so, I think that's a very unfortunate uh, trajectory uh, for the United States and its people uh, to um, have their productive industry uh, diverted into wealth destroying and dangerous uh, military industrial complex. And perhaps, perhaps, I don't know if we have time for uh, a couple of questions. How are we going? Okay, that's good. Uh, I would just mention one other thing. I'm, sh I'm sure others will mention it as well, but it's of personal interest and a bit of amusement that the uh, US Senate uh, Intelligence Committee, which has 14, um, senators uh, just uh, Friday, the week before last, um, added an uh, addendum to the proposed yearly intelligence bill, uh, section 623. Uh, and section 623 is a WikiLeaks bill, nakedly uh, stated, which uh, tries to define uh, me and my staff as a non-state, a non-state intelligence agency. Uh, and so when I first saw this, I thought, well, that's kind of cool, having your own, having your own Senate bill uh, <laughs> with, with, with your own number on it. Uh, I want to, there was one dissenter out of the 14, which is Ron Wyden. I want to con congratulate him for his uh, principal dissent. Uh, he has over a number of similar issues dissented in the past. Um, but we'll go to the House and it will, it will go to the Senate uh, and it, when you track where this comes from, non-state intelligence agency, it's, it's kind of, it's incoherent. What the hell does that mean? Non-state, <laughs> non-state intelligence agency. That's very odd. Uh, um, well, it comes from a Mike Pompeo, uh, the new Trump director of the CIA. I hear he was uh, a, uh, a pick by Mike Pence. Uh, so he's pushed that as some kind of Pompeo doctrine. I do know where it's come from, which I, I will leave for a, di a different time, uh, where, it, where it actually originated within the, uh, within the machine. But um, yeah, I, I don't know what should we like, say, have t-shirts with all the way to the top with 623. Uh, or there should be some campaign to, to absolutely mock uh, this absurd construction. Uh, when, we, when it first came out, uh, 
I said, look, look, the CIA, it was actually the maiden speech of Pompeo, uh, is uh, calling us a, a non-state uh, intelligence agency. This is absurd uh, to uh, be called this uh, phrase by a state non-intelligence agency. Uh, but, but seriously, that I think is a very also an interesting question uh, on the, is there any similarity to uh, what media organizations do and what intelligence agencies do? Well, media organizations uh, develop sources, uh, protect them, take their information, analyze it. Uh, and the analytical part of intelligence agencies also develop sources, take the information, uh, and analyze it. But the, the key difference is what happens at the end, or rather, what should happen at the end, which is a media organization publishes, uh, an intelligence organization doesn't publish. Uh, and on this uh, spectrum between uh, intelligence organization uh, and a pure publisher, uh, WikiLeaks is famously uh, uh, obsessively uh, pure in its publishing. That is what we obtain, provided it fits our editorial criteria of being uh, significant and suppressed, uh, then we publish all of it, uh, it sometimes to much criticism. Uh, whereas organizations like the New York Times, these are very much uh, closer to the in, uh, intelligence agency uh, behavior because they suppress information prior, prior to elections. They also publish fake information uh, leading to, to war. In fact, as someone who's involved in, in you know, the media business and who's been the, the subject of a lot of media, uh, I can't tell you the um, degree of uh, contempt uh, and, frankly, revulsion I feel for uh, most of the media industry. Uh, there are some fine exceptions, uh, uh, but the, uh, these are exceptional people in part because they are such an exception and have to nonetheless deal in that environment. If, if you uh, think about the Iraq war, um, what is the, we all know the culpability of the CIA but, and, and the, the Bush administration, but what is the culpability of, of journalists in the Iraq war and in other wars? Uh, well, look at the numbers. Uh, if you look at the number of uh, political journalists, uh, in the United States, but there are equally uh, serious problems here in the United Kingdom. Uh, actually, it's, it's something like 5,000 uh, active uh, political journalists. We're not talking about sport or, or cooking or something. So the failure of these political journalists, uh, national security journalists, uh, their failure to, to do what they claim is their job uh, resulted in how many deaths? Easily over a million, maybe maybe pushing up to up to two million if you include uh, the knock-on effects in in Syria and Libya. Uh, so, what is the death count uh, per journalist? Uh, it, it is several hundred people uh, killed by your average political journalist uh, as a result of their incompetence and their failure uh, to do the the job that they promised to do, which is to hold power to account, uh, to not censor information and withhold it uh, from the public if they know about it and to be uh, ever, ever questioning. Uh, and I would say also to, to fight for the, the rights to continue that activity. So in the United States, that's the First Amendment internationally, uh, Article 19. So um, are we going? OK. Uh, so just to one more uh, thought. Um, it, it's a, I think, dangerous in this business to, to, be, to run into the trap of uh, securitizing what we perceive to be a dangerous phenomenon. Uh, because if you look at what the, essentially what the war racket is, uh, yes, it's essentially, it's essentially a way to launder uh, tax dollars uh, uh, using some excuse. But what is the excuse? Uh, well, the excuse is that there's some threat. And so they're always involved in in uh, hyping up threats in order to uh, increase their share of the tax take. And internationally, of course, it's a more of a protection racket, which is you pay us and, and we won't bomb you. 
but I think we should be we should be careful about uh, overstating the competence uh, of these organizations. Once you understand that they're basically just in it for the money, uh, the uh, tremendous incompetence uh, start, starts to um, starts to be something that uh, is that you would expect uh, to manifest. For example, um, I'm fond of saying that at one level, the the CIA is perhaps the most incompetent organization that has ever existed. Uh, let's look at what it professes its competence to be. It, it professes its competence as protecting the security interests uh, of the American people uh, and to a degree uh, its allies. Uh, but this is the organization uh, whose actions uh, gave us a theocracy in Iran, uh, who gave us Pinochet uh, in Chile, uh, who gave us the Iraq war and all the, the terrorism and squalor and death uh, that emerged from that, uh, who gave us Libya uh, and turbocharged uh, ISIS and jihadist groups uh, across the Middle East. Uh, this, this is a, an agency that uh, can't even keep its secrets from WikiLeaks, a, a small, um, a small <laughs> publisher. I just, I find that absolute madness. Uh, uh, look at our rescue of Edward Stone from Hong Kong, why I was trapped in this embassy. That's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but I have, a, I have a cool staff, they're bright people, but we're a small investigative publisher. Uh, how can it be that in a, in a well-defined toss-up um, to get Edward Snowden asylum somewhere or have him be arrested, uh, where it's, it's just us lot and a few, and a few friends and lawyers uh, against these titanic organizations uh, and we're successful? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so the the answer the answer is that you know I'd like the answer to be that you know all, all me and and my staff now lawyers we're all geniuses, but the the I'm afraid the reality uh, <laughs> the the reality is that these are just totally incompetent organisations with with a, a Stalinist a Stalinist a bureaucratic structure who don't really believe uh, in half the work that they do. Uh, who are always looking about how to get, you know, to to um, get some money, uh, enter into the contractor sphere, uh, and so on. So I th think, in some ways, we should be quite hopeful about those examples of just how incompetent these organisations are. Um, and while at the at the kind of physical level, installing mass surveillance uh, and producing bombs and dropping them, they are competent and they have good logistics. At the, uh, the dynamic political level, they're very incompetent. Uh, and I think we have to show people that incompetence. Uh, so, so people are not scared uh, to, uh, to resist their activities, uh, which, are, which are very destructive. Uh, and to uh, laugh uh, at these naked uh, spy kings, which in Virginia are all around.